Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, session number 32 in our series. Uh, we started earlier this year. I, most of you are, are uh, returning. Uh, some of you are new. Welcome if for the first time. Uh, we started these in late March around the question, what is a library if the building is closed? After the pandemic was declared, we were all in the state of shock, chaos, and you know, what? Then we uh, moved into response mode with the series and, and uh, uh, have had a, a number of uh, extraordinary speakers. I'll, I'll give you a little flashback in a minute here. Uh, and it proceeded through the year, almost each Friday with interesting presentations about what's going on. This uh, 2021 here, uh, it's an appropriated uh, image to me, it just kind of struck me as, as we look ahead <clears throat> to the year, this, this kind of got, it's gold, but it's also kind of chaotic. So that's sort of the mixed message we've got going forward. Uh, we are the Human Libraries Network. Uh, we're producing these. We've been uh, working with libraries on technology projects for over 10 years, uh, also on uh, policy areas. Uh, we'll also touch on a moment. Uh, our sessions are and have been hosted by, hosted and recorded by the uh, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions uh, based out of uh, the Netherlands. And at the controls is our trusted partner, Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy there at IFLA, uh, a great organization. If you're not a member, uh, you should think about it. ALA is, of course, and many of the national associations. That's the point. Most national associations and national libraries are the principal members of, of IFLA. Uh, we have our first uh, uh, sponsor today, the session sponsor is the Internet Society, who we'll hear about a little bit because they're supporting one of the projects we're going to hear about today from, from Georgia. Great group. Uh, our speakers are um, two. Well, counting Daniel, uh, you know, uh, extraordinary leaders in, in the library world in, in the U.S. Uh, Michelle Jeske there at the, de uh, the deputy, the director of the public library in Denver and Julia Walker, the state librarian in Georgia and Daniel, her, her IT director. We'll come back to that. Uh, but let's, uh, let's have a look back here for a second. Uh, COVID, yeah. Um, we're going to skip the gory details this week. We've shown the graphs of the increase of the skyrocketing hockey stick increase in numbers of we're going to we're just going to leave those today and it's just the backdrop for for the year that uh, it was a response to that. This whole series is is a, an idea of a kind of a mobilization uh, to deal with that initially as a response and then we've shifted into recovery trying to think ahead and what are what are we going to build next? Uh, the classic kind of crisis opportunity uh, uh, context for taking action in, uh, against not only this crisis, but you know this this year has been a crisis sandwich, a, a crisis layer cake. I mean, we've had uh, social crisis, we have continuing climate crisis, uh, massive uh, weather events. Uh, you know, the, the, the financial impact has just been one thing after another. And, and this election crisis, you know, to top it all off. Uh, but still libraries persist and uh, the, the activities that we have explored, the kind of the things we started out looking at around the aspects of this question about a closed library are as, uh, internet access, digital services, physical materials and social infrastructure. So these we're going to hear more about today. Uh, we, we've had 85 presentations uh, counting today, uh, recorded and available at the gig library, gigabitlibraries.net website on the pandemic response page. You'll find it um, in, in these 33 sessions. We've had uh, roughly 3,500 registrations for this series. So. It's, it's been really interesting and, and uh, a marvel, really. This, this is, I tried to get everybody on a, a couple of pages that has appeared on the, uh, on the sessions, and I, I just couldn't do it. I, you know, I had to squeeze uh, everybody in to just get it on the page. There might even have been one more person that I didn't quite 
get on this page. But it, not only are, are uh, these recorded, it's just some excellent material that I would recommend to anybody uh, interested in, in the world of libraries and what's happening this year and how uh, librarians have responded and their support and, and partners. Uh, but also, just from my point, I have to just be thankful. I've had a chance to have individual conversations with all of these people uh, in the run up to the sessions and then also a chance to uh, talk with them as they made these really interesting presentations from policy to projects to general outlooks and so on. It's been great. And, and I hope we can come close to matching this in 2021. COVID is still with us, of course. And will continue to provide you know the backdrop for all all the things that we're doing uh the the world shifted overnight as a result of this virus uh it, our entire civilization has conformed to it every aspect of how we operate and function has had to accommodate uh the demands of this virus virus it's just so sudden it's not the first global pandemic but it's the first one that's had so much impact in so short a time. And we don't know yet quite what the impact is. Our focus looking ahead uh, in the policy area is we're expecting, you know, significant federal action uh, in the early part of the year. Uh, they're, they're, everyone seems to agree that we need infrastructure legislation. Everyone seems to agree we need more broadband. Everyone seems to agree that everyone should be connected to the Internet or have a chance to be connected to the Internet. The way to do that, we think, and we'll be advocating for, not alone, uh, is uh, are things like uh, investments in middle mile. We saw this uh, in uh, 2009 with the Stimulus Act uh, and the BTOP program. Many of you were involved in that. We think that's a, a great template for what to do more of. Open middle mile basically is a way to connect libraries and other anchor institutions that are deep into communities, we can also call markets with infrastructure, fiber infrastructure, backhaul. And then these points represent both endpoints, priority endpoints, libraries and, and schools and clinics and so forth, you know, serve the great majority of the population. So just connecting them alone would justify the investment. The double win is that that fiber to those points represents a potential for interconnect for last mile providers to connect wired and wireless uh, uh, extensions to reach the homes and offices further out. It reduces their risk and costs substantially. Uh, E-rate changes, the, the one that's just kind of on top right now that everybody's talking about is the idea to use uh, the E-rate program to connect not school buildings, but schools. That is to say the community of learners and libraries and their patrons with the same uh, with the same uh, connectivity technologies, and so yes, the I think the FCC is confusing uh, schools with buildings, with school buildings and libraries with library services and patrons, and so it seems like a fairly small, uh, though a great impact change to uh, allow uh, leveraging those connections to connect the people that actually are the, the institutions rather than the buildings alone. Uh, we would expect more uh, funds to flow through IMLS as we saw in the CARES program. And they'll probably distribute those pretty much the way they distribute funds. Roughly 60% go out through the state, through the state libraries, the other 40% to run the agency and then do direct grants. So we advise everyone to, you know, plan have a have a project plan ready to go because as the cares and other activities have uh, suggested if you're ready when something comes out you have an advantage we're also going to get into uh you know uh you don't know uh, the the impact of the internet we've been advocating that everybody be connected okay connected to what maybe we had an idea of what the internet was years ago but what is it today and what is it going to be tomorrow what is it evolving into it's not quite as benevolent as we all imagined it would be 25 years ago uh, the answer to so many problems you know and, and the ability for people to uh, create different all kinds of enterprises and the general decentralization of business and communications and the rest of it well 
it's done all that. And then it's, it's now uh, offering a whole new set of uh, risks of uh, uh, malicious actors, the dependency. Society is totally dependent on the internet. I mean, if the internet goes out for some reason, it, it, we pretty much just are back to the stone age. Uh, that, that dependency is really, uh, you know, we have to analyze that and, and do things that might mitigate that risk, like creating uh, community networks as a kind of a backup plan. There are a whole range of that. We'll get into those. Loss of privacy. I mean, this is just stunning how, how you know, I went online and bought a pair of socks, uh, well, more than a pair, for, for, some, for some gifts from a, a store, you know, just right to the store site, bought the socks. Now I'm getting ads from other locations, you know, to, trying to sell me stocks, socks. I'm being stalked by the internet and, and I don't like it. Uh, well, you know, it's just one small thing, but there's more to that. We'll get into that. It's this idea of trust. Who are we trusting on the internet? We've got these huge platform companies. Increasingly, they're, as the saying goes, uh, you're either paying for the product or you are the product. And this is kind of uncomfortable uh, in both ways, at least from what we thought the internet was going to be. So we'll get into some of those things. Um, our central focus is going to be, has been around uh, libraries creating wireless networks, wide area wireless networks, or joining with other anchor institutions to create these these uh, wireless connections, both as a uh, as a redundant uh, network and also to extend access to the institutions. Um, this is our basic view here of, of uh, uh, an entry into this discussion about, uh, back to E-rate, about uh, school buses and bookmobiles being new uh, access stations or access points uh, as they go around. There's, there are 400, over 400,000 school buses in the country. That's a lot, but it's a pretty expensive access point to drive it somewhere. But you know, we're still in an emergency and there's just tens of millions of people without access. Our submission into that group are library access stations. This is what we've talked about, uh, some kind of fixed point that should be in every neighborhood. You sh everyone should be within easy distance of one of these public access li library access stations. Think of a kind of a combination of phone, emergency call box, an e-government kiosk, and a library access point, you know, and you know where it is and it's there. You have an outage, a personal outage, a general outage. It should be there uh, as a backup or in some cases as a primary resource. It's not desirable, but you know, parking lot uh, Wi-Fi is a thing now and libraries are playing a big part of that uh, as we move forward. So these can be all over the place in different public uh, locations. They can even be engineered to be portable to support events. Uh, whether they're disaster events or civic events like this uh, uh, marathon race in uh, Maine uh, or in, in disaster response. So one project uh, moved their uh, site over to support a, a pop-up uh, testing clinic that's involved. Uh, check out hotspots are being used, used in a lot of the same way, but we're not focused on those so much as we are in-house capabilities. Hotspots are great, but you know, they're subscriptions and there's third party services. We're talking about in-house library Wi-Fi, which is what tens of millions of people depend upon. And uh, and it should because it is it is just an outstanding thing. You know, roughly one in three adults access the internet at a library pre-pandemic. Why should they have to go to one of the 17,000 now parking lots to do that? We think library uh, Wi-Fi should be extended out into the community, not perhaps everywhere, but you know, to places that are convenient to people. Uh, jumping one year further, now only one year more predicted the Starlink map of 60,000 satellites. This is just a phenomenal uh, uh, accomplishment. Whether it actually works, we're going to have to find out. But just the idea that it could is is uh, science, totally science fiction. So back to action here and to our speakers, uh, Michelle and Julie and Daniel. Uh, we're really happy to have you. 
uh, we look forward to hearing what you've what you brought with us. Uh, Michelle is going to uh, give us a preview of uh, her her thinking on uh, social infrastructure, something that we've added to our mix. Uh, it wasn't one of our original subject areas, but it's just so obvious, uh, like many others perhaps we're not getting, but uh, it, it, it's critical to, to our mental health, our emotional well-being, uh, and, and this is something that's in great stress. So we will turn it over to uh, Michelle right now. Well, Michelle, um, please take it away. Let me also say Michelle is the president of the Public Library Association in addition, in addition to being the library director in Denver. Uh, so Michelle, you've got a lot going on this year. So <laughs> thanks for taking the time for us. Yeah, thank you, Don. I've, um, I'm honored to be here with all of you today and I really love the way you framed this series and I congratulate you on um, this amazing year of information and support for the library and other parts of our community. So I'm going to take a second here to share my screen and we'll get started. All good, can you see? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so as I said, it's really nice to be here with you today um, to be able to share some hopefully not too random thoughts I have at the end of this uh, long COVID year and uh, kind of another long COVID week. Um, and I'm gonna include some neat things that I think we're doing here in Denver, just as an example. Um, so just starting with, you know, what is a library if the building is closed? I love, I love that that's what you're calling this. Um, Don mentioned that the last part of the series has been themed libraries in recovery. And I'm also wondering if that is it or is it really libraries as recovery? Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm not able to advance. Here we go, okay. Um, so I think that the journey of public libraries has been one of both resilience and tradition and also reinvention and adaptation. Resilience, of course, because libraries have persevered, persevered through many difficult times and, and of course, lots of change. Tradition, because while some people don't recognize the connection from the original American public libraries in the 1800s to what they see today, the roots, of course, are there. Denver's first city librarian, I'm the 10th, by the way, so it's a popular uh, long-term long -term gig here. Um, his name was John Cotton Dana. He's actually pretty famous in the library industry. He referred to the library as a center of public happiness, which we just love. And today, um, the Denver Public Library's vision is a strong community where everyone thrives. And I don't know that those are that different from each other. So 130 years separation there, pretty much the same vision. The public library, of course, is for everyone. And frankly, I think that's a major reason that we continue to be so important and unique in the community because everyone is welcome. But we know public libraries haven't stayed exactly the same and the way that we deliver on public happiness and being for everyone has changed over time. We've been on a long journey of reinvention and adaptation. This same John Cotton Dana introduced popular fiction to the public library. He let children in and he let people take books home. It doesn't seem novel now, um, but it certainly was then. And I sometimes think that we, we all think that all the innovation has just happened in the last couple of decades, but this is an embedded part of our profession. Public libraries are really one of the last remaining welcoming spaces where all people can explore and connect for free. Dubbed by Andrew Carnegie, Palaces for the People, a notion that sociologist Eric Kleinenberg has resurfaced in recent years, public libraries are considered social infrastructure. 
He defines that as the physical spaces and organizations that shape the way people interact. And what you see here is the original Carnegie funded library in Denver, which still sits right across the park from our central library now. So when libraries responded to COVID-19 by either partially, mostly, or completely closing their doors, the infrastructure seemingly disappeared. Some wondered, not us of course, can libraries still be relevant when their spaces aren't accessible to the public? Just what is or where is the center of public happiness without the building? Now a year into the pandemic, not only do we know just how relevant and needed we are, but many people in our communities understand this better as well. And that's because public libraries have responded to community needs with considerable nimbleness and ingenuity. Our spaces are special and unique indeed, but I would argue, however, that it is the people who work in libraries that are the key to the social infrastructure far more than the buildings themselves. Kleinenberg names physical spaces and organizations as the social infrastructure. Well, the organizations are the people who work in them. Library workers quickly began reimagining what a library with or without a building could be in March, 2020. They quickly began offering essential services, resources, and programs in new and innovative ways. And here in Denver, our doors have been closed to the public now for over nine months, and we continue to help shape the way people interact and bring people together. In addition to curbside and home delivery service of books and other materials, we're connecting people with outdoor computer and internet access and doing outreach to people at schools, meal sites, older adult facilities, food banks, and more. You might call this outreach, but generally outreach has been about getting people to come to the library. No, this is what this is bringing what you can from the library to them. And I think we're learning a lot from this. Libraries, of course, are providing virtual and phone programs and meetups, a whole new and exciting way for people to connect. We're also creating and distributing take and make kits and literacy kits so families and others can connect and be to creative together at home. Many libraries are offering some or all of these or other services. It's really, to me, been inspirational to see the creativity and compassion for our community members in need of support for remote learning, employment, mental health, companionship, and more. Many libraries, of course, have opened back up some have closed down again, and some, like many in urban communities in particular, have not been able to let people into our buildings since March. When the community's needs are growing and they will continue to grow with the economic fallout from all this, how do you create new opportunities to connect people together and to connect people to their community assets? to recreate that social infrastructure without the usual library physical spaces. We know that the most vulnerable in any community are feeling severe economic and health impacts from the COVID-19 crisis. This is compounded by the fact that nearly all social services have gone online. Already daunting tasks of getting an education, finding work, dealing with legal issues, receiving health care and other social programs, and even just connecting with family can require people to have stable digital access, making the divide between the haves and the have nots all the more painful. We know that libraries are essential partners in a community's economic recovery, in workforce and small business development, student success, and digital inclusion. And we also know that across the country, demand for library services increases during economic downturns. Libraries are not nice to haves, they're needs. We provide important and necessary services for people. This now dated map shows where the households without reliable internet are, which is in the city's most racially and ethnically diverse neighborhoods with documented disparities. And we're using this data to prioritize access to digital services. 
So what do you do? You create new physical spaces. We've left our Wi-Fi on outside all of our buildings to ensure everyone can get free access to the internet with their own phones, tablets, and laptops. In 2019, we had over 676,000 sessions on our Wi-Fi system. So we know there's a huge need even in good times. But as you all know, many people don't have their own devices. So then you have to figure out how to provide them. So we have 12 libraries where customers are using library laptops and the library's Wi-Fi services outside of our buildings with staff support, obviously socially distanced, to apply for jobs and benefits, print out immigration paperwork, contact loved ones, look for books and more. So far, we've had over 5,000 sessions across the system since July. And at our central library, we're serving customers with an average of 58 computer sessions per day in October and November. And believe me, it can be warm in Denver in the winter, but it can also be quite cold. So we're not offering this on days when it's below 45. And we're currently seeking permitting for heaters to extend the service in colder weather. But what about people who can't get to the library, to Don's point, or don't know the library has offerings even if it's closed, or don't think the library is for them? Well, you can take the library to them. Our outreach team has partnered with schools and the housing authority, after school programs, and a lot of other community organizations to provide pop-up library service. We're distributing water, food, personal care, and hygiene kits, and just connecting with people, letting isolated people know that we're still here for them. We're also taking laptops out and using the Wi-Fi off the bookmobiles and sometimes hotspots to bring digital connections to our stops. We're also using, <clears throat> excuse me, we're also using CARES funding to purchase and check out more Chromebooks and hotspots and increasing the checkout times to three months. We recently procured, sorry, I'm gonna need some tea. <clears throat> Keep adding to this pool with additional funds, even though we're facing severe budget cuts. We recently procured another 440 Chromebooks and hotspots and customers will soon be able to check out either a package of both pieces or one or the other, depending on their need. And we just got more money from our city budgeting process to get another 250 in early 2021. And according to that map I showed you earlier, we'll be promoting this primarily in the neighborhoods with the highest need and with an emphasis on workforce services clients. We're also trying to continue to customize programs and services to the needs of the people we're serving and really unapologetically prioritizing those with the most needs. In what we call the before times, we had dedicated services for immigrants and refugees at 10 of our library locations. It really was the epitome of the social infrastructure concept. We connected people with each other and with specialized staff with many different language skills and with support and assistance on immigration and naturalization with family programming. So kids would have things to do while adults practice their English language skills with pro bono legal services, community building activities. We were really building social capital. And at first when we closed this felt impossible to replicate this program is designed around personal relationships and trust and the building and space felt critical to that, but we had to figure it out. And it turns out in addition to the internet, the good old phone option has turned out to be pretty useful. Currently there are no other organizations in Denver offering citizenship or English support by phone. So participants without access to computers or Wi-Fi have been using this resource to stay connected and meet their goals. And they're also getting a chance to connect with others, an antidote to social isolation. And there have been some unexpected benefits to online and phone-based programming. For example, transportation, which has been an enormous barrier to participation given limited and expensive public transportation options is now a non-issue and people can participate from the comfort of their homes without worrying about childcare, catching the bus, 
or commuting after a long day of work. So continuing to provide connection online and by phone, even after our libraries reopen, will allow the most vulnerable community members to access life-changing services. Another unexpected benefit of online meetings is the opportunity to practice technology skills along the way. Those who are able to access Google Meet, Zoom, and other tools have been learning valuable skills as they do so. And some are just honestly more comfortable in this environment. We had a customer recently who said, this is the only platform where he feels he can express himself and voice his ideas when it's difficult for him to manage public speaking anywhere else. Unfortunately, there are of course many participants who are left behind by the lack of access to technology. So we are taking laptops and hotspots out to communities where immigrants and refugees live or congregate. Unfortunately, we don't have any photos of this, but I thought you might want to see the specific kits we've been putting together to support these communities. And don't get me wrong, we can't wait to gather again in our spaces, but we are learning a lot about how there are barriers to these spaces too, and that you can create connections in other ways in other places. Another population we're meeting where they are is people experiencing homelessness and other life challenges. We are fortunate to have developed a community resource team of social workers and peer navigators. Where these people are used to be at the library, which is why we have this team at the library. But of course, this population and others are not currently at the library. What we know is that more than one third of these individuals who seek this team support have no other connection to social, medical, or housing services. This team helps people connect to the resources they need, everything from housing to mental health services to employment support. And in the past, we also tried to create social connection and developed programs like this one you see here, a morning concert outside the Central Library where this population used to congregate before we open. This is obviously not very possible now. So we've continued to try to do this critical work out on the streets during the pandemic. In fact, this team was one of the first in the city providing connection to people spending time outside of or near our branches. Those who've been living outside are being moved around the city and cannot find stability. And there are many new people on the streets. The picture on the left is one of our staff members providing a book, water and personal care kit to somebody camping on the street. And next week we start providing digital access to people staying at the city's first safe outdoor space, which is city endorsed camping if you're not familiar with it. And that's what you see here on the right. We're literally taking the library to this community. We're also really excited to have just received a grant through which we'll be able to provide two positions to provide digital access to support mental health, substance misuse and wellness for this community, which has been very disconnected to services due to COVID-19. This grant is also gonna allow us to purchase additional technology devices and hotspots that we can provide directly to people experiencing homelessness along with a one-year data plan. This is really new for us. And of course, we'll be evaluating it. I've been sharing a lot about our library because that's of course what I know best. And I wanted to make some points about how you can take the people out of the library and still have a library. Many libraries are doing other very innovative and interesting work as well. And I'll just repeat where I began. Our spaces are special and unique indeed. Beautiful things happen in these spaces. They're irreplaceable spaces of joy, learning and engagement. We're spending over $75 million over the next few years to renovate half of our libraries. So know that we value these spaces and cannot wait to get back fully into them. However, it is the people who work in libraries that are the key to the social infrastructure. We've always known that, but it's been proven this year. And I hope that we can all take something away from that. There are barriers to our spaces and the most vulnerable among us may need us somewhere else. So what can we do about that? With others, I think we can do a lot. Thank you.
Wow. That is just amazing, Michelle. Uh, really a beautiful presentation uh, of, of your library and, and how you're, as we describe it, you know, taking the library inside out. Uh, you know, this has been a conversation for a long time. How can libraries, you know, meet their uh, patrons' need out into the community? And, you know, of course, this is an example of uh, doing that. Like, that's the main thing. Not the main thing. You you talked about the digital services, uh, somewhat, which I'm sure are up. Uh, but uh, how? What, what you're the, the really touching uh, an important story you talk about, you know, supporting supporting immigrants and, and with a telephone. Uh, that, that just really resonates with me because, it, you know, it, it but it, it rests on relationships. I, it's probably difficult to just call up out of the blue. But if somebody is already connected to the library and they get a call from an actual person, the voice is a very different thing than, than a text on the internet or even a, what we're doing right here, uh, a personal call. So I can see how effective that would be. And, 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 and it points to the other thing is you, you said, you know, going back, can't, can't wait to get back to you know, where we were, but are we actually gonna get back to where we were? Well, some changes like you've mentioned that one maybe will be something different when we come out of this. Maybe how we actually occupy space will continue to be different for a long time. We may want to keep a little distance from each other. Uh, so I was wondering if if your library overhauls are taking to a, into account a different way of managing the space, the physical space inside of the library. Are you thinking of, you know, are, are you are you a, a thinking that you would need a lower density in these spaces when they open? I think that's a really great question. We've been thinking about it a lot. Um, and as we've been able to modify plans <laughs> that hadn't already been, you know, kind of set in stone, um, we are, especially thinking around bathrooms and making sure that there's adequate space. I will say that we've thought a lot about how it will take some time for people, probably at least some of us to want to be close to others. But I also think that once we get past that, there's gonna be a craving for human in-person connection. And I think also because of the economic fallout that we're seeing, um, there may be other community spaces that don't even exist in the future. So I feel like our meeting spaces, our programming spaces, our communal spaces are gonna be needed more than ever. I just can't tell you when that's gonna be. That may be a couple of years, off, you know, um, but we're planning on continuing to create them because I think that human connection is vital. I'm not saying that we'll transfer, you know, a lot of these programs and services completely to external or online. I think it's, we're going to have to figure out a new balance because we have figured, we've figured out that there are barriers and we need to get out of our buildings more than we were previously. So it's, it's gonna be some new balance. Uh, get out of the buildings and create new spaces. I mm -hmm. mean, you're, you showed your, you know, your pop-ups. Uh, we used an icon of uh, the old Peanuts uh, cartoon, Lucy in her, you know, her advice booth as a kind of a, a stand-in for what you actually are doing. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. And I, I think that is very definitely a, gonna, gonna be a trend is, is taking it uh, to people. So excellent, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, good luck on the rest of your tenure. Good luck with the, the remodel and, and the rest of it. And uh, now we're gonna turn it over to uh, Julie, Julie Walker, the uh, state librarian for the, the state of Georgia, who's doing some interesting projects. This is gonna be a little bit of a shift from, from a library and what li individual libraries are facing in general in the context of the pandemic to what libraries are doing uh, around connectivity. And Julie and uh, Daniel are gonna tell us what they're, what's happening in, in Georgia. So Julie, welcome back uh, and take it away. Thank you, Donna. It's really nice to be back and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone again. Um, 
I'd like to first say I'm not at all surprised at the amazing work that Michelle and Denver Public Library are doing. I'm very familiar uh, with her work for many years and um, I just am terribly impressed with their response to what we've all faced this year. Um, Julie, Georgia, excuse me, are you, yeah. Julie, are you, are you, uh, is your camera on? It is not. Shall I turn it on? My lighting is sure, not very good. Sure, sure. I will be happy to, I will be happy I'm, to turn it on. I'm, Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, Georgia is a very large state, a very diverse state. Um, the needs of our libraries really differ from the urban areas to the rural areas, large and small. Uh, our libraries right now are in all phases of reopening and some of them continue to move forward or move backwards as circumstances dictate. Uh, the situation Michelle described in Denver um, is very much what is playing out in our larger cities where the libraries are not yet able to welcome patrons back into their buildings. Uh, many of our libraries are, however. Um, we are doing a lot with parking lot Wi-Fi sessions and Chromebook checkouts and many of the other things that libraries across the country are, are doing to try to help people who are pursuing remote learning, um, applying for jobs, all the things that, that people still need us for. Um, our IT team has devised a comprehensive program that's designed to meet all of these diverse needs. And I'm excited to have Daniel talk about our Libraries Without Walls program, which is funded by CARES Act funding and some state allocated bond funding. And it was designed to serve a variety of different libraries. We stay in really close contact with our library leadership across the state and just try to continue evolving our offerings as new needs arise. So it is, it's a moving target here as it is everywhere and we're just doing our best. Before I turn it over to Daniel, I'd like to add one thing. I am working with the uh, COSLA group, the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies, and I direct the Public Policy Committee there. And we are really closely monitoring the emergency federal funding that's being discussed right this minute in Congress um, because there is a provision for funding for libraries. Currently, that provision is strictly for Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, we in, in COSLA are advocating for that funding to come with maximum flexibility so that every state can address their specific needs. Hotspots are, are direly needed in some places. In some places, that is not the best solution and the money is needed for other uh, purchases and programs. So we are we are actively working with ALA and advocating in in Congress so that libraries are not only included but are included in ways that will help all of us address the needs that we see today and tomorrow. And with that, I am pleased to turn it over to Daniel, our IT director. His team has just done a fantastic job with this program and I'm excited for him to be able to share it with you. Thank you, Thank Julie. You, Julie. Uh, and I think Julie said it best describing George's libraries as diverse and diverse libraries need diverse solutions. So I'm gonna walk you through what we've explored over the entire year, um, our Libraries Without Walls grants and some of the trends that we're seeing right now with our libraries. So give me a moment to get this screen share up. All right, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect, thank you. All right. So before we can talk about the Libraries Without Walls grants, we really need to talk about the whole year and where we started. So right when COVID hit, we kind of had our rapid response situation. Um, and the first thing that we designed was a Wi-Fi availability map. Um, and then we followed that with a hotspot rollout, a small rollout of hotspot devices to libraries that had lending devices in place, uh, partnering with the Literacy for All here in Georgia. And then um, we did our round one Chromebook lending program. So the Wi-Fi map, I think this is something that basically all libraries that I've spoken to have done something similar to this since the pandemic hit. 
And we surveyed all of our libraries. I think they probably were going insane by the end of the first couple of weeks of this because we were surveying them so extensively. But we got all of their information and we put it on this map and made this map available. As you can see, it has uh, close to 40,000 views already. Um, and this is done easily and free through Google Maps. And then we identified each library as whether or not they had opened their Wi-Fi, which the majority of our libraries removed any passwords or login information needed to get onto their Wi-Fi. Whether or not they didn't have li or Wi-Fi, in this case, almost every library that didn't have Wi-Fi was actively under construction. So we just wanted to make sure that patrons knew that if they did make the trek out to that library, because they were going to try and get on um, wireless through the parking lot or something like that, that it wouldn't be available there. And then for other libraries, we uh, let people know if they had the password posted at the entrance or if the library card was required. And if you clicked on any of these, uh, it would open up and give you speed information on the internet at that library as well, if we had that available. And we've been adding more information to that sense in preparation for libraries to reopen. We've surveyed on things like makerspace availability, and we're gonna be continuing to use this map as a way for them to identify what our libraries have. The second thing we looked at was our hotspot rollout. Um, and so we worked with Literacy for All to deliver cellular hotspots to our libraries, um, all of those with temporary data plans and set up the ability for those libraries to continue the data plans after this initial period ended. Uh, this was where we first started running into, I think, some of the issues that everybody's running into, which is low stock of devices. And we were actually unable to get our hands on hotspots themselves. So we ended up using cell phones, very low cost cell phones and delivering those to libraries. Um, this is great because we were able to put something out when there really wasn't stock available, but it obviously comes with challenges when you're handing a fully functional cell phone off to a patron with a device. It's uh, not nearly as locked down as we might desire. And then that brought us to our round one of our Chromebook lending program um, where we, partnered with libraries that already had lending programs in place and delivered 250 Chrome devices that were already set up and configured. We've been working with Chrome for years now. Um, and so we already had the infrastructure in place to support something like this. So we worked with the vendor to basically um, set up every device and have it fully managed, ready to go. All the settings were proper. And then these devices were uh, drop shipped directly to our libraries in some cases are our libraries were closed and they were drop shipped to the uh, front door of library directors at their home even. Um, and then we partnered with the university system to get these devices. Uh, for Our priority was students essentially. So we wanted to get them into the hands of students in need. So then that brought us to later in the year um, where we worked on our Libraries Without Walls grants. And this is partially, I think Julie mentioned it, but it's partially uh, funded by CARES funding and by local state bond funding as well. And this grant was broken up into five different areas. G Suite expansion for our libraries. We were really concerned about making sure that our library staff themselves had a strong platform to work from, especially with them being spread out all over, working from home in many cases. Uh, round two of our Chromebooks, where we took that first round and our lessons learned from that and expanded that to libraries that didn't necessarily have any lending programs in place, because we really wanted to foster the development of those lending programs outside of the, the walls of the library. And then our uh, more diverse ones are tech innovation and Wi-Fi expansion. Tech innovation, uh, I'll talk about here in a little bit more, but it's kind of a catch-all for any innovative grant that helps deal with COVID. Um, and was related to technology. And then Wi-Fi expansion is probably the one Don's expecting to hear the most about here. Uh, and that's our expansion outside of the walls of libraries for the most part. And then finally, broadband infrastructure is a grant to help fund um, the non-E-rate funded portion of technology going to libraries. So the first one, like I said, was our G Suite platform. And this is something that we've been working with libraries on for the last few years. And we want to make sure that we gave an option to any libraries that were not already hosted at the state level to join our G Suite program. This is a fantastic situation because once we have everybody on the same platform, 
it fosters that easy communication. They're able to chat with each other, all the libraries very easily. Um, and it was especially important because everybody was switching to uh, remote work and they were needing a platform to be able to uh, virtually chat and do video recordings and things like that. So G Suite gave us that opportunity. The second one was our Chrome round two. And this is where we bumped it up from 250 devices to 500. And like I said, we brought this mostly to libraries that did not already have lending policies in place. And we used that same partnership with the university system to make sure that libraries were aware of students in their area that were in need of devices. And we ran into the same issue that we had with the uh, hotspots that I talked about earlier with the, um, where we had to use cell phones, where there's been extremely low stock of devices for Chrome devices. So we're actually, we've got all of the framework designed for this second round, but we are still waiting on the delivery of the devices. Um, and I think we're expecting to see those rolling out early January is my hope, but we'll find out. And then our next grant that we rolled out was our tech innovation grant. And this is our latest grant that just closed. And this was to assist libraries with funding for pretty much any innovative technology that focused on a solution to COVID impact. Um, we had a lot of different, uh, very interesting applications, but I would say the, the bulk of our our projects were awarded to Wi-Fi expansion, which was interesting because we also have that and they knew that that was coming down the line. Um, expanded device lending programs, so wanting to go beyond just that that base number of Chrome devices that had been lent out. Hotspot lending programs, which is something that we hadn't yet included in this. And then things like self-checkout machines. We had a lot of libraries that were looking into uh, reducing interaction with the public so that they could keep their doors open. So we had libraries wanting to implement self-checkout where uh, they, basically there was zero interaction with their patrons whatsoever throughout the process. And then finally we get to our uh, Wi-Fi expansion. And so the intention of this grant was to assist libraries uh, with extending Wi-Fi beyond just inside the library um, and to narrow the digital divide for our patrons, especially students. Uh, and this is still currently open. It closes at the end of the year. And applications so far have focused mainly on bringing the library itself up to a robust level of Wi-Fi capability on site. I think what we're seeing is that a lot of libraries um, are having a exorbitant number of people sitting in their parking lots. And so they wanna make sure before they worry about extending beyond the library property that what they've got on site is as strong as they can make it. So that's been interesting so far. We do have a number of libraries that we've reached out to in relation to TV white space, line of sight, uh, point to point Wi-Fi, things like that, that are also interested in applying to this. So I think we're gonna see a larger range of applications before this closes. And then finally, we've got our broadband infrastructure one, where this is basically to help bring all libraries up to a standard base of baseline of Wi-Fi availability and statistics by reimbursing the non-discounted portion of that category two funding, not, not provided by USAC. And then the grant that uh, Don was talking about earlier is a TV white space grant that we're working on alongside Internet Society um, and Gigabit Libraries Network to push out TV white space technology to one of our most viable systems in the state for TV white space. And that's the Ohupi Regional Library System in Vadeya, Georgia. And so what this system is looking at doing is putting in a very robust TV white space platform, a 360 degree platform. Um, and they will then put in, start with three client sites. Um, and they are looking at a number of sites right now. I don't think they've necessarily picked their exact location, but they are looking at things like parks, community centers, um, shelters, things like that. And then they're also making sure that they put in a level of resiliency and redundancy for this. So they're looking at, to start, they're putting in battery backups at all of these client sites that if there is a power failure, they'll still be able to connect. But they also have the great fortune of having a local uh, solar panel producer in their town. And so they are trying to extend this uh, grant and create a partnership with that solar panel producer to put those on site as well. So you'll have solar energy and battery backups on site providing about as resilient of a situation as possible. 
so some of the trends we're running into, this has been interesting. This has been an interesting year. You know, we've we've attacked this in every possible way that we can. As you've seen, we've we've provided hotspots, Chrome devices, we're working on expanding Wi-Fi beyond the walls of our libraries. And what we've noticed immediately is that libraries, as I said, are really interested in solidifying that parking lot Wi-Fi first. They know that their patrons know where their library location is, how to get there, and they know that they're going to be able to get Wi-Fi at that location. So we're seeing a lot of that, that push to make sure that they feel solid before they start reaching beyond that. The other issue that we've seen with expanding beyond libraries is E-rate eligibility. There's always concerns about this. Don has talked about this many, many times in the past, um, but that concern about covering that internet portion that leaves the walls of their library that wouldn't be E-rate covered under current rules. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is a request for packaged loaner devices. And by that, I mean a hotspot combined with a Chromebook or a laptop or a tablet or something like that. Our libraries are very interested in the concept of being able to provide an all-in-one solution to an entire family, wherever they may be. So if they need to work from home, they can come grab this device, um, a hotspot, and their entire family can get online with their cell phones or whatever devices they may have alongside the device that's lent to them. And then the final trend that we're seeing is we're starting to see people exploring options beyond TV white space as well, which I'm really interested in seeing because TV white space is a phenomenal platform. Um, it's very robust. It can pierce through uh, trees and coverage and buildings and things like that. But there are other solutions such as point to point and line of sight Wi-Fi, which may not be nearly as simple to set up, but the cost is significantly reduced and the internet speed that's available across it is much, much higher. You can get gigabit speed over solutions like this. So we're trying to make sure that our libraries have all the information that they could possibly need to explore all of these. And we've created many sections on our website about this. Uh, and personally, you know, Don, you mentioned at the beginning, I'm kind of interested in seeing what comes next from programs like Starlink. I've been watching a lot of their um, speed tests and such, and I know that they're their hardware and beta is about $500 and their monthly cost is about $100 per month, which seems like a fairly reasonable cost when you start looking at the data plan costs for hotspots and such. So I'm excited to see what that looks like moving forward. And if you need to get in touch with Julie Walker I about any of these programs we're working on, you can see both of them here. You can see our information here. Thank you. That's great, Daniel. Uh, you covered a lot of ground. Uh, <laughs> Michelle is uh, dropping off as she needs to go. So I want to thank you, Michelle. Uh, we're going to hang around a little bit longer here. Uh, we're not up for quite uh, an hour yet, but uh, uh, we'll stay over anyway. But thanks, Michelle. That was that was great and, and good luck. Uh, Julie, uh, you and Daniel touched on, you know, a wide range of activities and, and uh, grant opportunities. I had, I had a question related to the the number of people that are, are you collecting data on how many people are actually accessing the library digital services and then parking lots. You know, this is all anecdotal right now, but there should be some data. I just wondered if you had any of it. You showed all the hotspots, but did you, did you have <laughs> session numbers or anything like that? In as many cases as we can, we do. So a lot of libraries, if their doors are shut, we know that those Wi-Fi usage numbers are coming from the parking lot. You know, it's, it's that simple. In areas where they're open and there's a combination of people who feel less comfortable coming into the library <laughs> and maybe sitting out in the library, it's a little bit harder to differentiate. We do have um, a system that recently presented at our yearly technology conference where their library is surrounded by green space. And so what they wanted to do was blanket all of that green space as widely as possible with Wi-Fi and make sure that that kind of park-like area around them was supported. And that was an incredible project. I worked with them from early stages and I think they spent under $5,000 to put these gigantic wireless access points all the way around the roof. Um, and basically the access points were so powerful that the 
issue with connection came down to the consumer device, not the access points. You know, it provided wireless as far as you could possibly reach it with your own device. And so I think for systems like that, where they've got a very um, segmented interface between the exterior and interior, they're able to get those kinds of numbers. But for most of our libraries, it's all one interface. And but I you're seeing, add, yeah, it, please go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to add one little anecdote to that. Um, one of our very rural, very poor counties that has a population of 1600 people uh, notified us that in the first 30 days that they were closed, that spanned March and April, they had 450 connections from their parking lot. And you know, for a population of that size, that's pretty amazing. That is, that is amazing. And it, you know, it's also uh, uh, an indicator of need and, and demand for, for access that, that people have, which is, you know, as we pointed out, uh, some, many people go to the library uh, for a bunch of reasons. You know, they, maybe they have uh, other sources of access, but they've gone to the library for different reasons. You know, it's faster, it's more comfortable, somebody's there to help them, it's safe all kinds of reasons and this is you know what what has been a, a kind of a gap in connectivity we we've, we've talked about it mostly related to the students i suppose but you know everybody that lacks is it, it's it's gone from kind of a national embarrassment uh, that we haven't connected everyone with a basic service you know this is the principle of universal service when it's a basic service like electricity everybody should have affordable access to it that was the principle anyway until the arrival of the web actually uh, 25 years ago. And then, you know, these companies just started doing things strictly in, in the way of normal corporations uh, as though they were Cisco or something, just return on investment kind of uh, uh, approaches. And it's left a lot of people uh, cut off from, from reasonable uh, access to not only, you know, Amazon type stuff, but public services, public information. And, and we've said all along that we feel that the government has an obligation, government at every level has an obligation to assure access to government services, public information, public services. And they can't, and when you, you know, they, they automate uh, paper processes for the normal reasons, save money and more efficient, but then they start creating new things you can't even do with paper. And when you say, well, what about the people who don't have a connection? They say, hmm, ah, well, go to the library, they'll help you. Well, okay, they will, and they do, uh, but no, they're not sharing the savings from these automation processes with the libraries who have had to take on more, yet more responsibilities uh, because of just demand. Uh, we had a question about uh, managing uh, loaners to disappear, Daniel. I, what, what do you do when they don't come back? I guess like a book, right? You start charging them a daily fine. <laughs> <laughs> Most of that is um, up to the library itself. And I will say, you know, that is a really, really common problem that I hate to hear because it doesn't happen that often. It really doesn't. Um, from a state level, we have been managing uh, Chrome rollouts since 2013. We're up to almost 5,000 devices that we manage for libraries across the state. And when a device disappears, I'm notified about it. And I think that's happened three or four times over this entire period. Um, Obviously, we're about to have a much larger number that leave the library for an extended period of time. You know, these loaning, loaner programs that we've been doing have been extended term loans because that's really the only logical way to do it at this point. But uh, it really has not been an issue. So, so you're saying you know, that if, if it is that, an issue, that, we're able to disable the devices and make them pop up with a screen. Are you that says, disable devices? I was going to say, pack, it has pack an this issue up and that... put it in the in a book drop is what we usually say. That way they don't even have to interact. You know, we don't know why uh, this device disappeared, but we can right. put a message up that says, just put a little bubble wrap around it and toss it in the book drop. It'll be fine. It's a Chromebook. It's super robust. It's made to be, right. you know, thrown around and dropped on the ground. So, uh, Well, that's great. There's a small problem, but it sounds like the bigger problem is, as others have remarked, is just the lack of availability of these devices because of course the demand has exploded and that's what we've been hearing everywhere is you just can't get your hands on these things right now that there's an yeah. enormous backlog so you're yeah. hoping that'll unlock in january a little bit though huh it has um i've heard strange reports that uh the shipping companies are kind of holding out too 
to see if they can get uh, tariffs reduced. So um, there are lots of issues why numbers are being held back. But uh, I do know that, for instance, the device that the device type that we're waiting on, there are well over a million of them in stock in China in warehouses waiting to come over. So we're just kind of waiting to see what happens with those devices, how rapidly they'll actually reach us. The difficulty seems to be getting them shipped over in a rapid manner, not necessarily getting them produced. So, Or as you infer, maybe the difficulty is the wider context in which that particular problem is uh, yeah. set, you know, as in international relations. Uh, very interesting observation. There's a lot more, there are many more examples like that where uh, we're dependent on China and other countries for really essential kinds of products and services. Um, let's see. Just trying to look for any other questions. Uh, telemedicine, Donna asked about that. You know, telemed appointments. You're are the are you helping people with those? You did before. They would come in and you would set them up. Uh, is the are the libraries? How are they managing that in the parking lot? They go out the parking lots, right? So they just need to know how to do it themselves, or right? But I guess the question That's is: available. How are you supporting people in the parking lots, or are you are your libraries? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Parking well, yeah. lots. So, socially distanced, but we we do. Uh huh. Okay, that's great. Um. We saw one example of a, uh, a library in Texas that was doing gaming night, drive up gaming night. So they, they pulled in a, a big panel truck oh, fun. and projected the screen on the truck. And then the gamers were all in their cars, you know, competing uh, real time. I thought that was, and, and why not do uh, uh you know, sessions like that. Why not do classes like that? Uh, I think yeah. they're also looking at the innovation that's going on. is just so impressive. And that's one of the things, I guess, uh, as we kind of wrap up our hour here, uh, that these, this is a, a, just an unbelievable challenge to deal with this environment that the, the, that the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the virus has created for us. But, you know, this country gives you some hope in the midst of all of this denial uh, and rejection of reality, there's some hope that that Americans have proven, I mean, humans in general, pretty resilient, but the, the, uh, the, the tendency to invent new solutions, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's just unique to us, but we're, we're, we're pretty good at it. And if there was ever a time to be inventive and innovative, it's now. And it'll be really interesting to see what kind of things go beyond this, uh, this current environment, which are, you know, we should have been doing already. And I think we touched on a couple of today. So, uh, Julie, uh, last word, uh, anything to, you know, any call to action for everybody that's, that's watching or will be watching uh, the recording later on? I just think it's so important and so valuable to have these sessions where we're sh sharing what we're doing, because I think we're all learning and, and getting ideas. I've been so proud of our libraries. They've been so resilient, so creative, and they, they have never just you know, given up and said, this is too much. They're just continuing to try to serve their communities as best they can. I also would urge everybody to monitor this, the federal emergency funding that's working its way through Congress now. And if you have any relationship with your senators or representatives, this would be a great time to let them know that libraries have a big need to be included in that funding. And thanks so great much for the point. opportunity. Great point on that, and and thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'd like to invite everyone to unmute at this point right now. Everyone, could you unmute? Unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to give our our presenters a round of applause, if you would, please, just like we were there at first. Thank you. Very good, very good. Okay, that concludes our final Friday, the final session this year. Uh, we're gonna take holiday uh, through the end of the year and we'll be back on January the 8th with John Sallett from the Benton Institute 
uh, in a new paper that he's uh, written about more middle mile, more fiber. We've talked a lot about wireless, but mm -hmm. we need fiber everywhere to support mm -hmm. that wireless. And so it'll be a really uh, important uh, discussion to kick off the new year. So we're, we may come back with a special edition, a year end report Good. on our specific project, the, uh, the committee's second nets project, but you'll, you'll hear about it if we manage to pull that off and you'll be welcome and you will be welcome uh, next year and we'll all try to rise up to this challenge together and mm -hmm. thanks again and till next year thank you thank you thank you thanks everyone thank you aloha <laughs>